During the 1967 Summer of Love, Mum very kindly made me a paisley shirt and in the holidays we took a flat in Belgium. I went alone to see a French film, which I didn't understand, except for the brief appearance by Terry Thomas as the English villain, and I gave my nationality away when I laughed at the only joke in English which he delivered. Mum and Dad purchased a folding bicycle that I found very useful over the next two academic years. Kettering Technical College, 1967 to 1969. I began to come out of my shell when I started to attend Kettering Technical College. The members of staff seemed so much more dedicated to their profession than the teachers at Wellingborough. I was so interested in the new subjects that I was studying, especially law, accounting, and economics. It was the law lecturer, Mr. Wells, who in the second year suggested that I consider applying to take a degree, something I hadn't even dreamed of. Mr. McKinley, the principal, encouraged me in my application to become a VSO volunteer. The Kettering branch recommended me to HQ in London where I went for an interview but unfortunately I was unsuccessful. I found that the fellow students were more mature and accepting of me compared to my school experience but I still found social interaction and making friends difficult. On Saturdays and in the holidays I worked at Wicksteed Park, directing cars into the car park and working on the big wheel. One day a party of Down Syndrome children joined the queue for the big wheel. After we had loaded several of the cars, I noticed that a couple in the car at the top of the wheel were releasing the safety bar and standing up. The worldly wise and long-suffering man who was in charge ordered, get them out, in a very resigned fashion. And so in reverse, we unloaded each car, and so the visitors unfortunately never had their ride. Once while on car park duty, a group of mods arrived on their scooters followed shortly afterwards by a group of rockers on their motorbikes. One of them called Gasser. I recognised as having been a scout in the Abington Troop, who had been dismissed for failing to attend church parade. The man in charge ordered me and the other part-time workers to stand between them. Fortunately, they decided not to fight that day. I also joined the newly formed Venture Scout Group. One of the most memorable activities was a potholing weekend in Derbyshire. Occasionally we would meet with the local Ranger Guide Group and it was there that I met Diane Bray who was also on the same business studies course at college. I fell in love with her but it took me over a year before I could find the courage to ask her out and then she told me that she already had a boyfriend. At the end of the first year I gained four more O-levels and a credit grade for the first year of the Ordinary National Diploma course. On this basis I applied to study for a sandwich degree at Portsmouth Polytechnic and so proceeded to search for an employer to sponsor me. Having tried many, including visits to Cabris in Bourneville and Western Helicopters in Yeovil, Dad drove me down to Maidenhead for an interview 
with the Southern Electricity Board, who selected me as their new management trainee. In the summer holidays of 1968, we went on holiday to Lenerted Wells, where we stayed in a bungalow owned by the Bishop of London. From there we went pony trekking and I went on a two-day hike. During the second year I worked for Tom Hooper on his fruit and vegetable stall on the Kettering and Wellingborough markets. This involved very early mornings and 12 hour days. But for 3 hours work on Friday and 12 hours on Saturday I was paid £5. The man who was hired to drive the firm's lorry persuaded me to join a football pool syndicate and to recruit students from college. Having done so, he ran off with the first week's money without sending it off to Little Woods. In the summer I worked full time for £15 a week at a wood yard owned by a Polish man whose brother had recently died when the bulldozer he was in dug up a live electric cable. The workforce was largely made up of Italians who had come to Kettering following the Second World War, possibly having been prisoners of war. To start with I was put on the first machine from which the largest chunks of wood had to be carried. After a week of that I was nearly dead and they agreed to move me to the second machine from which lighter pieces fell. After five weeks of this the owner asked me to stay with them and train to become a manager of the plant. Our 1969 holiday was taken at a chalet near Aberystwyth where I awaited my examination results. Two A-levels and an overall credit on the Ordinary National Diploma course meant that I would be accepted at Portsmouth. It was a good moment. The only thing that spoilt transition to Portsmouth was an argument that I had with Mum on returning after the holiday. She was shoving me and much to my shame I pushed her back and she fell banging her head on the wall. Mum was okay, but Dad was furious, so I made my exit. Still in shorts, t-shirt and sandals, I walked the 17 miles to Marston Trussell, then rang home to find out if I'd be welcome back. On the return, it began to rain heavily, so I hitched the lift, and a kind couple in a sports car stopped and drove me home. Portsmouth, 1969-1973 In September 1969, with possessions packed into my Spratton Hall trunk, I moved to the lodgings in Beechwood Crescent Hillsey, the home of Mr and Mrs Guernsey, and began training as a management trainee with the Southern Electricity Board Area Branch, based in Cosham. I passed my driving test, obtained a car for £45 and painted a picture of a girl in a bikini on the bonnet. My landlady did not approve and insisted that I find a garage for the vehicle. I began to attend St Francis Church Hilsey and because they were desperate asked me to play piano for some services. I volunteered to work with the Portsmouth Corporation scheme for the care of the elderly and conducted many fact-finding home visits, sending in 
written reports. I noticed an advertisement, Want to Parachute, in the Portsmouth Polytechnic Students' Union building. And so it was that I made my way to the Cosham Territorial Army Drill Hall for an interview. The sign outside was coloured blue and referred to D Squadron, so I wondered if it was an RAF unit. After a few weeks, I was invited to take part in a selection course starting early in January 1970. Every Thursday evening we learnt about navigation, field craft and survival and on alternate weekends from Friday evening we were taken on exercise by three tonner. First job on arrival was to build a bivvy, cook something from the 24 hour ration pack on a hexi burner and then get some sleep before an early start. Bergens had to weigh at least 40 pounds. If not, painted bricks were added. Then came the long distance solo trek with checkpoints along the way before returning to Portsmouth on Sunday evening. After three such weekends in the South Downs the numbers of participants were clearly diminishing. Some had got lost en route and others just found it too much for them. Then came the three weekends in the Brecon Beacons. My first encounter with Penny Fan was not a pleasant one. The sun was shining at the start, but by the time of crossing the Roman road it was raining, the wind was getting up, and visibility very poor. With the sheer drop on the right, the wind became so strong with sudden gusts, that the final steep climb to the summit was only possible on hands and knees. It felt like a miracle to get down safely. Back in the three-tonner, Ian Irving, the training major, asked if we were ready for the next phase of the exercise. This was greeted by mumbling and some outright refusals. For Brecon 2, a fortnight later, we were offloaded at the Story Arms in preparation for the famous three times over the fan exercise. The night started off quite cold, but when I awoke I felt very cosy. Looking out, I saw that four inches of snow had fallen in the night and turned my bivvy into an igloo. Each of us had to complete the exercise with full kit within nine hours. I started from the lower Neuad Reservoir along the Roman road to a fantastic view from Penny Fan. After checking in at the summit, it was down to the story arms and back to the top. Next I was directed to the telephone box at the southern end of the Brecon's Reservoir and back up to Penny Fan. By this time I was quite enjoying the day and had overtaken many stragglers and was making good time. The last leg returning to Lower Newad Reservoir, did seem to go on forever, but I completed the course within seven hours. Sergeant Major Smith was waiting with a Land Rover and at first thought that I must have been over the mountain only twice. Now we were heading to Brecon again, this time for the long drag as it was affectionately known. 
The Friday night was perishing cold as we were ordered off the three tunners in the mountains north of Merthyr Tidbill. I swung down on the tailgate rope and as I hit the ground my whole back seemed to go into paralysis. I just stood there stunned while bodies and bergens continued to be unloaded around me. However I found that I was able to walk and carefully made my way to a nearby hollow in which a few of us built a vast canopy of our ponchos over the top, lit a fire and got into our sleeping bags. I just lay in mine and was enormously relieved in the morning to find that the paralysis had gone. As we set off individually, Major Irvin said to me, I expect a good time from you, Whiteman. Apparently I gained something of a reputation as the Penny Fan Hopper. So two of the trainees decided to tag along with me and take over the map reading. We were the last ones to reach the first checkpoint. As we made our way towards the I. Stradfell Reservoir, the number of cigarette and tea breaks that they insisted on gradually increased. So I made my excuses and set off alone, determined to make for lost time. Reaching the Story Arms checkpoint at dusk, there was enough time for a quick meal before the ascent of Penny Fan. At the top there was some moonlight and on the ridge heading east I met two others who were making good headway. As midnight passed we began to get a bit delirious. I definitely saw Mickey Mouse chasing Donald Duck on a nearby ridge and saw hundreds of people running in single file along the tops of the mountains on the horizon. By this time we were coming off the mountain, down the Roman road and joined an old railway line through the forest. Out of the forest the line went into an old semi-bricked off tunnel which we decided to go through and followed the railway to the southern end of Talibant Reservoir where we joined the main road. Dawn was breaking and there were only two or three miles to go, but walking on tarmac was murder to the feet after the 40 miles plus we had already travelled. A few years later, Mum, Dad, Margaret, Kathleen, Caroline and Andrew, with Elizabeth and John, climbed Penny Fan. Practical Psychology and Drama Moving between departments in the SEB, the reception that I received varied. I read the book by Dale Carnegie, How to Make Friends and Influence People, and learned from this the secret of getting through to difficult people. One supervisor was quite unimpressed by this young upstart of a student invading his territory. He gave me nothing to do and would not speak to me. One morning I looked at his desk for something that might tell me something about him and his interests. I asked him about the potted plant that took pride of place and in no time at all he opened up and then showed me round his department. It was as simple as that. In another department I met Bill Dawson who introduced me to the Paulsgrove Drama Group. I took part in two plays which were directed by Denise Fox. 
an Italian straw hat, as Emile Tavernier, and the importance of being earnest, as Reverend Chasuble. The local newspaper arts critic said that the part I played was more like a young curate than the character envisaged by Oscar Wilde. It was nice that Mum, Dad and Elizabeth came to Portsmouth to watch the two plays. In March, I embarked on the first academic session of the Business Studies degree at the Polytechnic. Back in Kettering, we built castles and mazes with the 100 milk crates formerly used as staging in church, went on treasure hunts and sang around the piano such songs as Elephants and Elephants that led into Food, Glorious Food. <laughs> 